Lord Jesus, we give thanks to thee that thou hast died to set us free. Made righteous through thy precious blood, we now are reconciled to God. Defend us, Lord, from sin and shame. Help us by thine almighty name to bear our crosses patiently, consoled by thy great agony. And thus the full assurance gain that thou to us wilt true remain and not forsake us in our strife until we enter into life. Amen. Good evening and welcome once again to our midweek Lenten services. We worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold the Father's love. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Behold the Son's grace. Behold the Spirit's gospel teaching. Please come to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we come before you out of need. You provide all that we need for body and life. You shower us with blessings too numerous to count, but our response to your generous care falls short in every way.
God's word says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It also tells us that God has in Christ reconciled the world to himself, not charging our sins against us. Therefore, by the authority and command of our Lord Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. readings for our midweek services have been a series from Isaiah's servant songs, that is, poetical portraits of who Jesus would be and what his life and ministry would be like hundreds of years before he was even born, and an example of how they were fulfilled in the New Testament. This evening we read the servant song from Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 10 which speaks of the coming Savior's willing submission to great shame and suffering and his unfailing determination to accomplish his saving mission. Isaiah 50, beginning in verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak, a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. We now sing together a prayer to our Savior to remember us in his kingdom. striking illustration from that servant song just read is the servant saying he's going to set his face like a flint. It means an unswerving devotion to the mission at hand, which Jesus illustrates for us in our New Testament reading from Luke and also his great compassion even for those who were rejecting him. Luke 13 verses 31 through 35. On that very day, some Pharisees came, saying to him, 
Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here ends our reading from Luke's Gospel. Congregation, please rise. We confess our faith in the person and work of that Savior in our creed for this evening. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. He did this that I should be his very own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and joy, just as he is risen from death lives and reigns in eternity. This is most certainly true.
this fourth and continuing session of the inquest into the death of Jesus of Nazareth is now in session. I would like to call to the witness stand Pontius Pilate. You may be seated. Do you solemnly promise, sir, that the evidence that you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? What is truth? Answer the question, your excellency. State your full name for the record. Pontius Pilate. And what office do you hold? I am the Roman governor of the region of Judea in Palestine, also of Samaria and several other southern territories. How long have you held this position? I was appointed by Roman Emperor Tiberius Caesar four years ago. Please describe your duties and privileges for this hearing. It is my duty to carry out the Emperor's orders in order to keep peace in all my territories, by force if necessary. Roman soldiers are garrisoned in large cities and important towns throughout the region and along many of our Roman roads. Taxes are collected for the emperor's purposes and for mine. I have a position of great power and wealth in my region, but truth be told, I despise the people whom I govern. Though you are enriched by their taxes from your own testimony, please go on. Is there any statement about your office as Roman governor that would bear and help this inquest into the death of Jesus of Nazareth? Very well. As you may or may not know, of all the lands under Roman jurisdiction, the territory of the Jews is by far the most difficult to govern. Their preoccupation with this individual they refer to as a messiah, and their refusal to acknowledge any other god beside their own have caused me and my governing predecessors no small amount of difficulty. I am already the fifth governor appointed in the last 20 years. Hmm. Turnover, that is interesting. Did you know Jesus of Nazareth? Yes. And when did you meet him? I met him just last week. Please relate to us, sir, in your own words, the circumstances of this meeting. Certainly. My first memory of that meeting was that it was very early in the morning, Friday morning. The Jews had arrested a man who they wanted to be tried. They brought him before me, and that man was Jesus of Nazareth. So, according to your own recollection, why was he taken into custody by the Jews? Well, first of all, they didn't even come into the palace. Something about their religious ceremonies or restrictions would have defiled them or made them unclean. They are so very picky. It's true what has been said about the little things. They will strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Anyway, as you might expect, I asked them what the charges were against the man and what they wanted me to do with him. So, now we're getting somewhere. What charges did they bring? They were highly impertinent. They dared to presume that the Roman court should simply accept their decision that this man was guilty on their word alone. Can you imagine what kind of Roman justice would that have been? So then I take it that you did not have a heightened sense of interest in dealing with this case. Certainly not. I had far more important cases to tend to. Well, what did you say to them? I told them that they should take this man and judge him according to their own laws. Evidently, they were not willing to follow that direction because you're here at this inquest as one who was intimately involved in the death of this man. This is true. They were out for his blood. They wanted him dead. Their intention was to get a capital punishment 
and a death sentence on at least one of the three charges that they have brought before me. Three charges. Enumerate them for us. The first was for insurrection. They claimed that this man, Jesus, had plans to overthrow the country. The second, they claimed that he told the, the other Jews not to pay taxes to Caesar. And the third charge was on a charge that he claimed to be someone called the Christ, some sort of king. Well, did you find a legal basis or any substance to these charges? I could see that they were quite hateful towards Jesus, and in all likelihood, this hate may have biased or prejudiced their charges. However, it was my duty to take this matter seriously and look into these allegations. Did you? Yes, I called Jesus into my palace and began to question him. My initial concern was in regard to the primary charge of his being the king of the Jews. So, an interrogation. What did the interrogation uncover? <laughs> he admitted that he was indeed the king of the Jews. What a shock of all the people in the world to have claimed to be a king. This man, this Jesus, was certainly the least likely candidate. He did not look or dress the part. <laughs> in fact, it was actually a bit amusing to me to think that the Jews likely deserved a king of this nature. You must have pursued that line of questioning somewhat further. What else did he have to say about himself? What he did say convinced me of his innocence. He said something to the effect of, my kingdom is not of this world. He claimed that if he had sought an earthly throne, that his followers would have risen up and fought for him, and that he wouldn't have been taken into custody in the first place. Yet, he did claim a throne, just an otherworldly one. You know, it seems odd as I think back about it now that the Jews were looking for a king of their own, but certainly this Jesus of Nazareth was not a king that they would accept. Well, did you put it to him point blank? Did you ask him directly whether he was a king? Yes, I did. And his response? His answer was, let me consult the transcription from the court reporter. You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Hmm, the truth. At that point, I then asked him with sarcastic skepticism, I'll admit, what is truth? I don't understand the snide skepticism. What did you mean by that question? Well, I grew up in a world where the only truth one should concern themselves with is something you can touch, see, taste, smell. I grew up in a world where might makes right, where authority and government are created by the people with the strongest armies and the most brilliant generals. Religion and philosophy are only so much guesswork and opinion. Who could possibly presume to have the absolute truth universally? And certainly, centering that truth around one single person, a miserable wretch as Jesus was, seems far-fetched to me. And yet, when asked if he were a king, he did answer in the affirmative on the basis of Jesus' statement, did you decide that he was guilty? No, just the opposite. I was convinced that whatever this king meant to his subjects, that he was no threat to me or to the throne of Tiberius Caesar. Well, presumably, case closed. You had a hearing, you determined that Jesus was innocent, and that was the end of the matter. No, sir, that was just the beginning. The beginning of what? That was merely the beginning of my problems with Jesus. The Jewish leaders then began bringing charge after charge, many accusations against Jesus, and Jesus just stood there and took it. He said nothing, not one word. He just let them go on and on. He was accused of stirring up trouble from Galilee to Jerusalem. When I heard mention of the region of Galilee, however, I then 
took that opportunity to send Jesus and the entire nuisance of a crowd to Herod, the ruler of that region, for further judgment. That, then, must have been the end of the matter with Herod. No, not at all. Herod sent him back to me. He could find no cause for death in the man either. I see. Well, Your Excellency, I'm going to let you step down from the stand, but please be advised you are subject to recall at a later time. Bailiff, you may allow Herod into our courtroom. I call to the witness stand Herod Antipas. Do you, sir, give your solemn promise that the evidence you are about to submit will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name for the record. Herod Antipas. Tell us about yourself. My father was Herod the Great. While he was alive, he ruled over most of Palestine. He had, with, uh, along with my older brother Archelaus and our half-brother Philip, he had sent them and myself to Rome for schooling. In his last will and testament, I was appointed as tetrarch over Galilee and also Perea. I see. Tell me, did you know this man, Jesus of Nazareth? Yes, I have been aware of his activities in the province for quite some time. When did you first meet him? Last week, Friday. Please recall, for the benefit of those present, the circumstances of that meeting. It was early Friday. Jesus had been charged by the Sanhedrin with blasphemy for claiming that he was the son of God. The Jewish re religious leaders were trying to get Pilate to convict him on some other charges as well. One of them was rioting, another was tax evasion, and the third was for saying that he was king. Um, Pilate had questioned him for quite some time on the whole king business, but finally concluded that Jesus was innocent of all charges. The Jews at the trial weren't satisfied though. They kept saying that Jesus was trying to stir up everybody all over, all the Jews all over the country, beginning at Galilee. And when Pilate heard the word Galilee, he thought of me. Since I was in Jerusalem at the time, he sent him to me. Some men might take it as a slight to be delegated a case such as this. What did you think of Pilate sending Jesus to you? Pilate and I had been at odds on a different matter for some time, and this was a step of his made in a good faith, a good faith gesture um, to show respect for my position. And I had wanted to see Jesus for some time anyway. A man in your position wanted to see an itinerant preacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Why was that? I had heard that he had been doing quite a number of these miracles all around my territory and in Perea and Judea and even up in Samaria. I really wanted to see one of those miracles. What happened when Jesus was brought to you? Not much. I asked him a lot of questions, and I mean a lot of them. The priests and the scribes had come along too, but Jesus refused to say anything. Even the soldiers tried to get him to open up and to talk. Some mocked him, others poked fun at him, but Jesus didn't speak at all, not even one word. So, did you ever see the miracle that you so desired to see? No, I didn't. I have never been so disappointed. What did you do with him then? Not much. Herod Antipas, isn't it a fact that your men of war abused Jesus of Nazareth, entertained yourselves with him, playing vicious games with him? Is it not a fact, sir, that you and your soldiers pretended to kneel before him as king, blindfolded him, struck him on the face, asking him to prophesy as to who it was who might have hit him? 
Look here, I don't see you. What... Isn't it a fact, Harry, that this is about all you were ever looking for? A little pleasure, a little fun, a little something to dismiss the boredom. I resent the implications of those questions. This, this has gone far enough. Far enough and too far. What did you do with Jesus when you were through abusing him? I sent it back to Pilate. There was nothing more I could do. I mean, he hadn't broken any laws, especially nothing worthy of death. There was nothing else I could do. I believe the point has been made for this assembly sufficiently for all to see the innocence of Jesus and the shamefulness of your own conduct. You may step down. You know who you're talking to? I resent and I refuse to be treated with such insolence. Step down, sir. This investigation reserves the right to recall Pontius Pilate to the witness stand at a future date. The hearing stands in recess.
our ongoing inquest into the death of Jesus of Nazareth seeks to answer this question. What did Jesus do to merit the death penalty? In other words, what crime did he commit? Tonight we have heard eyewitness testimony from two civil authorities, Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas. Each of them heard repeated charges of insurrection, activities designed to overthrow the government, tax evasion, forbidding people to pay their taxes to the emperor, and usurpation, that is, seeking to throw Caesar off his throne and take the throne in Caesar's place. In each case, Pilate determined, at least in private, that Jesus was absolutely not guilty. And as far as Herod goes, he found absolutely no evidence against Jesus either, because Jesus, before Herod and his mocking, abusive soldiers, was absolutely silent, strangely so, to their eyes. So we ask, were there serious crimes committed that morning of Good Friday at these hearings? The answer is yes. Not crimes committed by Jesus, but crimes committed against him. False charges being leveled against an innocent man, lies being told. False imprisonment of an innocent man. Vicious brutality and mocking inflicted on an innocent man. But before you assign blame, before you point the accusing finger at Pontius Pilate or Herod Antipas or the Jewish enemies or even those who struck the nails that pierced our Savior's hands and feet, it's good for each of us to look in the mirror, to look on the inside and remember the truth of the words we sing in a Latin hymn. Whence come these sorrows, whence this bitter anguish? It is my sin for which thou, Lord, must languish. Yea, all the wrath thou dost inherit, this I do merit. And so this Lenten season, when you meditate on the question, what did Jesus do to merit the death penalty? Remember that it was your sins and mine and that of the whole world that sent him to the cross. And remember with peace and joy the blessed words of this Bible truth from 1 Peter 3. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. All praise to his name. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord most holy, we thank you for your tremendous love for false sinners and that in your compassion and grace you freely gave yourself as the sacrifice for our sins, going forth silently as a lamb before its shearers is silent and presenting your perfect life as an offering for the salvation of us sinners. We thank you, dear Lord, for the finished work that you accomplished, your holy life, your blessed example, your gracious teaching, and your atoning death. Grant us the light of the Holy Spirit so that we may always be partakers of your eternal kingdom. Help us to imitate your example and to walk in your love. Grant that as children of heavenly light, we may daily repent of our sins, shun the ways of darkness and error, find full and free forgiveness in your shed blood and death on our behalf, and follow in the paths of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Dear Lord, we pray for all who have needs of either body or soul, for all of our loved ones who are in distant places, for all who have strayed from your word, for all who are suffering sickness or pain, 
and for all who mourn. Pour down your blessings upon them according to their need. Hear their prayers. Comfort them with your presence. We ask all this, dear Father, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus, and we also pray in his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We close with hymn 554.
Good evening and welcome one and all to our hour of worship this evening, especially any visitors who may be present and a warm welcome to those who are following us at home via live stream or later showing of our service video. Um, we have our regular order of worship uh, schedule for worship this weekend at 6.30 Saturday evening with Bible class following Sunday morning at 9 a.m. with Bible class and Sunday school following. May God and his grace be with you all.